Hello everyone, welcome and thank you for joining for this thematic webinar of the School Education Gateway, the initiative of European Union and the place to engage with European policy and practice for school education. So my name is Ina and my colleague Eleonora today on the backstage are delighted to support you for this webinar and uh, which will be dedicated to vocational education and training and work-based learning. Today we will talk about the innovative teaching and work-based learning practices that support students in, in obtaining the required skills and competences that help them to meet the challenges of the working life. So our first presentation will examine how technology can be used to support the specific needs of that and also the obstacles faced, especially in practical work-based learning. This information will be given by Andrew McCaution, who is a senior expert in vocational education and training and director of Lexus uh, Research and Consulting. He has spent almost all his 30-year career as a researcher uh, and consultant in the field uh, and conducting numerous European and international projects. Our second speaker, Monica Fashani, a senior project manager at the research development area of University of Studies, Guglielmo Marconi. Monica will tell us about her experience in managing the EVAT project um, aimed uh, at increasing the opportunities of initiating VET mobility activities. And finally, the webinar will, will uh, put a spotlight on this year's European Vocational Skills Week, which aims to change the perception about the value of vocational education training. Sue Bird, the policy officer at European Commission's DG for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion, will help us to learn more about this initiative. So before giving the floor to the, our speakers, I would like to point out that this webinar will be recorded and the recording will be available on the webinar page uh, together with the speakers' presentations. So you can pose any questions um, during the presentation in the chat box and we'll try to address as many questions as possible uh, in the end of the webinar. So Andrew, if you are ready, uh, I would like to give you the floor so you can start your presentation. Thank you very much, Ina. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be uh, presenting to you this afternoon. It's my first time on the School uh, Education Gateway, and I'm delighted to be here. I see that we have people from all over the world attending, which is wonderful. I, just to mention a few countries I've seen pop up, uh, Zambia, uh, Turkey, Portugal, so a wide range of people. Before um, presenting my uh, presentation, uh, I'd actually like to ask you a, a few questions to get a better idea uh, about who's in the room or who's in this Adobe uh, virtual space. So I haven't done this before, but I'm hoping that Inna will place onto the screen a couple of questions that I'd like to ask, just to get an idea of, of, of how often you've been using e-learning and digital learning technologies uh, as a teaching aid, uh, both in your own environments and also um, for your own learning and professional development. So here come the questions. So just allow a couple of seconds there for you to, to click on boxes. And we see this in real time, of course. So, that's the second question. Either can we go back to the first question first? I guess we have to allow a little bit of time. Aha, okay. So we're now doing the question about uh, your use of the e-learning as a, as a teaching aid. So we've all been going through a learning curve. I think this is about the the fifth um, video conferencing platform I've used, and it's the first time I've been on this one. So excuse me for any errors in my own uh, learning at the start. So interestingly, um, we have a quite a spread of people. We can't draw any conclusions from this, but it's very interesting to see that uh, in terms of using um, e-learning in your own learning and professional development. We've got, we've got quite a spread there across uh, the different categories. It's still not settled down, so I think it's still open. So we have about a third of people, maybe, using 
e-learning uh, once a day, if I can see this properly. Um, but a, a similar number actually using it only occasionally. And the same, the same actually applies uh, a little bit for, for using it as a teaching aid. So I think there's some similarities between those two bar, bar graphs in terms of whether you're using e-learning uh, for your own students, uh, but also whether you're using them for your own uh, professional development. That's great. So I think that gives us just a, a quick snapshot of, of our background of everyone who's here. And I think that's very representative of, of how the landscape uh, is at the moment. I think with COVID-19, we, we've actually, well, we're short of data. We've, I think we, being people in the research side of things and in the policy community, have been trying to uh, generate data. Um, and there's still a, a paucity of, of evidence, but it, it's very clear that we do have this spread of people in terms of their experience, and clearly that's, that's impacting on, on learners as well. But I want to take in this presentation a step sort of sideways or slightly backwards um, to give you a sort of an overall picture of, of digitalization uh, as I see it uh, in vocational education and training uh, before Monica actually focuses, focuses down on a concrete example. Uh, it's a huge topic. I've got what, around 20 minutes, and so I'll do my best to, to cover the main points. I should say that I've been working with the uh, vocational education and training working group which is covering digitalization and innovation uh, and is coordinated by the European Commission it's a working group of member states and some of some of the material in here comes from that work and our report is due out uh, later in the year so moving to my presentation can to move these no that's good okay so what about the wider context uh, for vocational education and training and work-based learning? Well, um, we are living in a world of innovation and digitalization uh, and also sudden dramatic shocks to that, of course. Um, we, innovation is, is key to economic and social uh, progress and um, we see innovation and, and digitalization itself taking place both outside VET and also inside VET and they're related in complex complex ways. Outside of uh, vocational education and training, we have uh, rapid automation, digitalization, new forms of work, uh, ever faster product innovation uh, driven by technological advances, um, fourth industrial revolution, robotics, artificial intelligence. These are things that are now um, in the mainstream of, of everyday discussions about the economy and society. And I think um, one of the important points to appreciate is that um, the, the nature of this um, form of innovation, which is in many ways disruptive and, disruptive and radical because we have both new technologies and the emergence of demand for new skills driven by digitalization in the labor, labor market. So many people are talking about um, a revolution in learning. So it's important to see how VET is positioned um, to deal with this. And on the face of it, I think VET is quite well positioned um, to respond to these needs, uh, to the challenges of innovation and digitalization in the wider economy. And, and digitalization within VET uh, has the potential to strengthen its response. There are, there are maybe three areas that it's worth identifying in terms of VET's distinctiveness. Um, in terms of provision, of course, it, we have this combination of school and work-based learning of uh, knowledge learning and experiential and practical learning. Um, in terms of its, its constituency of learners, we have both young people and we have both, and adults as well. Uh, we have also many young people who come, come from um, challenging socio-economic backgrounds who, who are uh, in the initial stages of education uh, within vocational education and training tracks uh, because of uh, selection and tracking systems within countries. For adults, the economic changes we're seeing, changes in the labour market, uh, are leading to demands for upskilling and reskilling, and that is also positioned to uh, be engaged in that as well. Uh, on the employer side of things, uh, work-based learning uh, necess necessitates a need to bring company trainers uh, to work alongside uh, teachers uh, within vet schools, of course. And employers who are seeing product and service innovation um, see a rising need for digital and transversal soft skills. So both those things, digital skills, but also a wider set of, of softer skills um, they need in their workforces. 
So what are we talking about uh, when we talk about uh, digitalization? Well, I, I've tried to capture the state of the art on this, this slide. Yeah, it's not easy um, when, you, when you look at the field. Um, it's quite, quite confusing um, and complex. Um, we have open educational resources available, uh, repositories of, of e-learning tools and courses and programs and other resources that teachers can use, open courseware. We have, of course, massive open online courses, MOOCs. Um, we also have things called nukes and spooks, and I'm, I'm grateful to uh, colleagues at INTEF uh, in Spain for that. Nukes are nano open online courses, and spooks are self-paced open online courses. So different sorts of, of courses available. There are, of course, commercial platforms available, such as uh, LinkedIn Learning, and of not to mention things like YouTube, which are, are full of, 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 um, of uh, teaching aids and, and learning advice of, of very variable quality, which is a point I'll come back to later. Mobile learning has become increasingly important as well. And uh, I guess at the leading edge of these forms of digital learning, we have simulations, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, AI learning analytics. And of course, a digital assessment and credentials is also important and has come to the fore, particularly uh, under COVID-19. So, that's the state of the art, but another important question is, is how did we get here? And I've tried to capture some of the main develops on, developments on this slide. And um, it's important to say with respect to this slide that um, although I've tried to divide it into decades to sort of rather simplify um, the story, um, over time we see technologies replacing one another, uh, or the same technology taking steps forward before being superseded. Um, so for example, in the 2000s, CD-ROMs and DVDs had increasing storage capacity and were integrated into PCs, having been in, been in use uh, well before that. Uh, the interesting thing is that um, much of the older tech, uh, of course, gets um, killed off by other subsequent developments. So TV, videotapes, and cassettes still in use in some cases, um, but DVDs, DVDs uh, killed off videotapes in the early 2000s. Um, and interactive whiteboards similarly replaced many combinations of DVD and TV. Uh, and one of the striking things here, I think, is that some of the tech and the ideas have been around for some time. Interactive whiteboards, 20, 30 years. Uh, open courseware concept, 20 years. Interestingly, um, one of the first educational apps in Google App Marketplace was called Grocket, and that was in 2010. So, so quite some time. And an interesting question is, well, has the rate of adoption been slow or fast? Uh, in the UK, it took until 2007 for 98% of secondary schools uh, to have an interactive whiteboard. And this is, again, something I'll come back to later on. So what's new now? We've got this, this overall trajectory. Well, I think in the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen a real uh, decoupling of teaching and learning from time and place, and also a massive increase in the ability to offer learners new and different experiences and provide faster, more tailored feedback. That is, of course, um, a, in potential. Um, but it doesn't mean this all this doesn't necessarily mean that new tech is being used for new purposes for innovation. And I think if we're going to talk about digitalization and innovation, it's always important to try and define our terms. So here I'm trying to be quite bold and offer a definition. Yeah, this, again, is another difficult area. Uh, it's quite hard to pin down digitalization, and it's also difficult to pin down what we mean by innovation. But one way of, of looking at it is that innovation is the use of new or significantly redesigned teaching and learning tools methods or environments, or, in, or new organizational methods, which I think is quite important to stress, are aimed at improving the quality of VET and supporting innovation for environmental sustainability, economic, and social goals. Um, an important question is how common innovation of this sort is. And uh, it's, hard, it's hard to know in reality. But uh, I was looking at the OECD's first international survey of, of teachers uh, teaching and Learning, TALIS, and it found that just over one quarter of teachers believed more innovation in their teaching would be valued in their schools. So this isn't putting anything at the, at the feet of teachers, it's actually the, a systemic issue. This was asked whether teachers thought their schools would value innovation, and interestingly, only a quarter did, um, which is an interesting finding. Along with defining digitalization and innovation, we also need to look at the relationship uh, between the two concepts. And uh, it's important to stress that digitalization doesn't always lead to innovation. Innovation 
doesn't necessarily rely on digitalization. But we do have a set of digital technologies and we also have teaching and learning. We have a set of, of pedagogies. How do these two come together? It's very complicated, of course. Um, I should say that these pedagogies are, in a way, constructions. Um, for he they represent clusters of teaching and learning methods. And I, this, this list is taken from an OECD publication um, called Teachers as Designers of Learning Environments. I think these are useful because they give us something to hold on to, um, because this can be quite a slippery topic when we're talking about pedagogies, especially in terms of innovation and relationship to digital technologies. I should also point out on this list something is missing, which is important in the digital domain, which is social or collaborative learning, but I'll return to that. Um, so those are the digital technologies. Those are the pedagogies. What more can we say about this? Well, in terms of where tech meets teaching, um, in VET, um, experiential learning is actually what VET is all about. And I think there's a lot of potential for digital technologies to enhance the type and scale of experiential learning in VET. To take one example, uh, video making. This is perhaps not using the latest tech, but actually the ETF has done some work on this, the European Training Foundation, which is very interesting. We can also talk about blended learning, this mixture of, of, of conventional classroom teaching and digital learning. Um, an important question for VET is how we might uh, use blended learning in situations where we have two learning environments, classroom and the workplace. Uh, much talk is made of, uh, of game-based learning. Uh, I think there's a good fit with important aspects of, of VET. Um, interestingly, it's popular in work, in, in work training for adults, uh, which is in contrast to many other forms of, of tech which might be used mainly in general school-based education. Um, game-based learning is also good for transversal skills. Uh, it's important to stress we're not talking necessarily about games per se. We're having game, gaming elements. And there's a very good example called VR uh, Hoogster from the Netherlands, uh, from Flanders, in fact, which is um, uh, well worth looking at. I mentioned social collaborative learning, and there's numerous possibilities to capitalize on, on this through you know, one of the key strengths of the internet, having numerous platforms. And I think it's also linked to, to gaming, which is often a collaborative activity. I mentioned assessment earlier. Um, Tech, there's a potential for e-portfolios, for example, to widen the evidence for assessment. And you can also speed up the way in which feedback is given to learners. SimSpray is a uh, virtual reality uh, simulation for spray painting, and it can give very quick feedback about the depth of paint and things of that sort, which, which then teachers can use to uh, can interpret for their, their students. And importantly, we can also have uh, digital learning, digital technology that improves the links between assessors and learners, and there's an example uh, funded by the EU, which is called the Trilog app, which is a uh, Trilog because it connects learners, um, teachers, and trainers uh, within companies. There are also platforms that link schools and workplace, and one of those is the Rialto platform. And it, it doesn't just connect schools and workplaces, but it improves coordination of knowledge acquisition in schools mainly, and practical learning mainly in the workplace. I think it's worth saying, uh, as I do at the bottom here, that COVID-19 uh, has revealed the extent to which that lacks the digital tools in relation to practical work-based elements. We have things like simulations that are, that are increasingly used, but often they involve um, some sort of, sort of kit um, that people need, and that's, that uh, is, is, not, is not obviously available at home. So it's a major challenge. What about the effects of digitalization? Well, I did a slide on this, but to be honest, um, there is a lack of evidence about the, the effects, and we need more of that. We need more research into what the impacts are on, on individual learners and on VET provision. Um, it can widen access. It can be very appealing to um, those uh, learners who I mentioned right at the beginning, who maybe come from challenging socioeconomic backgrounds, who want different ways of learning. But COVID-19 has shown the extent to which there are inequalities in access to digital, to digital technologies and digital skills. Um, and so an unintended consequence of, of reliance on digitalization, if we're not careful, may be increase, increasing inequality. Having said which, I think there is a lot of anecdotal evidence about um, how digital technology changes how learners learn, the range and its reach, its application, and so on. And it has positive effects in terms of motivation and cognition. It's also got consequences in terms of efficiency and effectiveness. Costs and benefits um, often uh, favor digital technologies very much in the classroom. So those are some of the some of the ways in which digital learning is actually having effects within vocational education and training. 
there are also a whole range of, of pros and cons of digitalization. And I won't dwell on these. You can maybe look at these um, afterwards because there's, there's a lot of positives and there are also a lot of, of challenges, um, some of which I've mentioned uh, already. So one of the important questions is, are, are we doing enough? And I think this graph is quite interesting. Um, the uptake, in relation to the uptake of technologies, the evidence is, is scarce. Uh, we have seen uh, uh, a general increase in participation in online learning, uh, doubling from 2007 to 2015. This is through Eurostat survey. This is not specifically in vocational training. This is a sort of general background picture. We do have from the Netherlands in 2015 a particular study of vocational education and training. And that showed that more than 50% of vet institutions were using most technologies at least some of the time. But only a more limited group was, was used regularly, digital text files, blogs, printed text files. Less commonly used were tests, simulations, interactive websites, ebooks, and games were used, as you can see, very rarely. So an important question is, do we need to move beyond text files and movies to more advanced applications that have the potential to transform learners' experiences and support pedagogical uh, innovations? There are therefore maybe two aspects to improve. The rate of take up. Uh, it's been reported that the speed of digitalization in education is up to five times slower than in other sectors. It could be because of poorly distributed knowledge and weak connectivity between stakeholders, uh, teachers, trainers, school leaders, policy makers, weak flows of information around all those stakeholders. Another aspect to improve is the depth of the effect. The, the, the impact of digitalization depends it seems to me on the inherent features of the technology and also how teachers want to use it as well as the pedagogical context and work-based learning is comparatively under provided for uh, by digital technology as I've mentioned already reasons may include cost uh, tradition of relying on company uh, equipment um, trainers aren't pedagogues so blended learning or gaming ele elements might be a challenge information is also key Interestingly, there was a school education gateway survey uh, that shows that teachers are most pleasantly surprised when they use online learning by, by its potential for innovation, flexibility, breadth of tools, and accessibility. So those are all clearly strengths from digitalization. So we have a set of challenges. Uh, teachers and trainers need to be able to see when the benefits of adoption outweigh the risks. Um, change involves a risk. For, we, we all have that experience. Um, and uh, change will only happen when people can s understand fully the nature of the risks and also the benefits. These links between digital, te digital technology and pedagogies are not always clear. Uh, more advanced techs, uh, tech needs more time, commitment and resources. So in all this, information, knowledge and skills are key so that teachers and trainers, school leaders, policy makers for that matter, can navigate the huge range of products available and they can know how to use them to full effect. And we also critically need to include the learners who are a source of, of latent demand. Um, we need to embrace the world of learners, especially young learners. Um, we've got quite an old teaching population in many countries. Um, but we all know now go online uh, to get uh, anything we need. And it's interesting if we look at um, some recent figures on online learning, which is here shown on the x-axis, against two variables, um, against households having access to a computer and individuals with basic or above basic digital skills. Um, these show that actually access to computer is, is important, so are digital skills, but in fact perhaps digital skills are now more important um, than others. So what can we do about it? Through all my thinking, um, I think <laughs> this quote cut through it. This is from a colleague of mine uh, working on an Erasmus Plus project, He's, and she said, uh, in an email to me, maybe the most important thing is to train or accompany teachers and trainers to know how, when and what for to use digital tools to make training more attractive, to allow pedagogical differentiation, these pedagogies are not discrete, they overlap, and to allow for efficiency because they'll be able to develop material anyway adapted to their needs. So we need to arm teachers and trainers um, with knowledge and skills. You've seen these challenges before. Here are some of the solutions that we could possibly look at. Training and networks for teachers and trainers. Digital skills development in the population. Better connectivity. We might have seen all these type of things before. But actually, some new angles are that teachers and trainers need 
initial teacher training and CPD to build knowledge and also to drive demand for e-learning and to be able to make informed choices. And the strategies and funding need to be comprehensive and coherent. Uh, they need to, there needs to be a systemic element um, within these, a sort of whole holistic approach. We've seen with COVID-19 that companies and schools that already had e-learning as a systemic element were much better able to respond to the crisis. Two other things I think are in these solutions that I don't think are given enough attention, haven't so far. One of these is intermediation. Uh, this is a term in financial services, which involves matching lenders and borrowers by a third party. And, and we need more um, structures and organizations and bodies in place that can actually do the research uh, on digital technologies and on pedagogies and provide teachers and trainers with that the knowledge and understanding for them to make the right decisions uh, about what will work best for their learners. We also, in terms of strategies, need to know what the the goal is, um, what the purpose of strategies and funding is. It's hard to know what makes for effective teaching, uh, as, as we know, and therefore if you're talking about innovations and how these might improve teaching and learning, that's a further challenge. And maybe it's not enough to pursue high quality, uh, perhaps we need to uh, pursue excellence as well. And my last sort of substantive slide here before my conclusions um, is related to a, a new um, EU initiative on centres of vocational excellence, um, which you can find out about on the um, European Commission website. I've, I've actually put this, this sort of donut diagram together because it captures really where digitalisation and inno innovation sits and where teaching and learning sits within this concept of vocational excellence that the European Commission is now taking forward and funding. You can see it sits right in the middle uh, of the concept of vocational excellence and it supports many other things. Um, the development of higher level VET programs, bringing initial vocational training and continuing vocational training together, and also supporting innovation and business startups uh, within the wider community. It's not just about VET being responsive, but it's also about um, VET being proactive and contributing to wider social and economic developments. So in conclusion, what can we say? If we go back to the diagram I used at the beginning of provision employers and learners, uh, hopefully I've shown that Digitalization has the potential to, for provision, improve communication between workplace and school. There are platforms that enable teachers and trainers to communicate. Uh, there, are, there are technologies that provide new and different learning experiences for sure and can support in a change and innovation in pedagogy. For learners, um, there are solutions for adults to upskill and reskill. Um, this decoupling of time and place in learning is, is, is critical. And there are opportunities to re-engage people turned off by traditional education as well. And for em employers and skills, um, I think there's, there's ample evidence that uh, digital technologies can meet the demand for digital skills and also for softer transversal skills through things like um, gaming, which develops team skills and, and so on. So that's, that's all from me. I hope I managed to condense a very big topic down into something that's digestible in a short period of time. Back to you, Inna. Thanks a lot, Andrew. I think it was very insightful. We will directly uh, move to the next uh, uh, presentation. Monica, are you here? If you are ready, perfect. I can already see. Okay, Monica, if you can uh, uh, turn on your microphone, the presentation is here. Yes, it's on. yes I can hear you. Okay, uh, sorry, I turned on the, the camera, but it's not well um, displayed. In any case, I will uh, talk. Uh, thanks a lot to School Education Gateway for uh, inviting me to talk to you in this webinar and thanks everybody it's a wide audience here uh, today thanks also to andrew because it was really an insightful presentation and i work in an online uh, um, university so uh, some of the insights were um, really uh, shareable with us as well uh, so i will start with my presentation uh, so as um, I'm Monica Fasciani and I'm a senior project manager in the research and development area of Marconi University in Rome. 
um, I'm going to talk about another aspect um, in the vet sector, which is the um, on-the-job experience based on mobility, transmissional mobility. And uh, I'm going to introduce a little bit our uh, university. Uh, first of all, uh, it's uh, Guglielmo Marconi University, which is the first uh, uh, online university recognized by the Italian Ministry of Education in 2004. And you can see from the slide some, uh, some data, um, which we have six uh, faculties, and we have also Italian and international educational and research structures with, uh, with six uh, departments. Um, and, uh, uh, our uh, premises are based in, uh, in, uh, in Rome. Um, we have also offices and departments in other areas. Uh, as for, the, um, for my, my office, we work in the research and development area, so we have many um, line of actions and uh, um, we, the, the core um, focus is uh, um, European funded um, projects. And we do projects, of course, on research with uh, um, Horizon 2020 and we do also uh, different projects with uh, the Erasmus Plus program to undertake initiatives that constitute strategic lines of development for the university both at national and international level we do also um, some networking uh, uh, work uh, in collaborating with companies and stakeholders and some consultancy um, work uh, in the field of european funding and uh, project cycle management so we have also a, a strength um, for working with schools. So we had many uh, funded projects under the Lifelong Learning Program and with EuroPaid as well. For the uh, Erasmus Plus Program, we had a key action three um, uh, project on social inclusion uh, in uh, education and training. Uh, the, the name was Boosting Global Citizenship Education Using Digital Storytelling. And we finalized last, last um, last year, two strategic partnerships projects in the field of VET. One was Discover Project, developing innovative science outreach for vocational education to encourage STEM uh, careers. And the other one was uh, the VET Project, online vocational education and training platform, which I'm going to uh, present today. Um, Sorry for the, I'm, I'm reading the, um, the chat and uh, yes, with the, the video, but it's the problem of my computer. I'm at home and uh, it's a very big the visualization with the camera. So maybe you see just my, um, my head. Um, okay, so um, uh, I'm, I'm going to present Yvette, as I told you, and uh, um, this is uh, um, a, a project uh, funded by the, um, the Turkish National Agency. The, um, the applicant was uh, the governorship of, um, of Istanbul, uh, which manages uh, uh, the relations with the schools in the district of Istanbul, and the name is Online Vocational Education and Training Platform, because we wanted to create uh, a platform for, for vets uh, um, providers uh, um, who could uh, uh, communicate, collaborate, and create uh, a mobility projects uh, uh, under the Erasmus Plus uh, umbrella program. Um, the participating countries were Turkey, Italy, and, uh, and Germany. And uh, we, we had two more uh, partners in, uh, in, um, in Turkey, uh, Ostakoy, which was uh, um, a vet school and Bogazici University, uh, a German partner and our university. So this is our team, just to show uh, the people who participated in the project. And so why the applicant decided to implement uh, such a project? Um, because they thought it was a good way to try to put together schools and companies and try to match directly the requirements and needs of both entities uh, in terms of creating a, a relation for transnational mobility. The objective was to create and reinforce synergies between formal and informal educational sectors as well as the labor market and to set up a favoring environment for work-based learning mobility as a complementary educational path in order to boost employability of young people. People. Um, 
We know also from uh, the reports from uh, CDFOP um, regarding the policies and practices of work-based learning that uh, improved cooperation between educational institutions and labor market mm -hmm. actors is needed um, in order to open up also schools to the, um, to the uh, world of uh, work. Um, so, how uh, do, did we want to create this synergy? Uh, we, we, we choose to create it exploiting the potential of mobility projects within the Erasmus Plus uh, program. We know that uh, mobility is expected to enhance uh, cooperation among the member states and promote a European dimensions and the main dimension also in the field of uh, education. And um, it can create stronger cohesion in Europe and preparing the workforce for the European European job market, enhancing also their intercultural education. Therefore, as, um, as I read, it's uh, not seen just a simple movement, but as a way to think uh, as a European uh, citizen. And the Erasmus Plus program in this regard uh, um, mm -hmm. had ambitious aims because it wanted to help students to become internationally competent and well prepared for job requirements. and. Um, in this interrelated European economy. And uh, uh, of course, uh, it should have an impact, a positive impact on the personal development of the students, and in particular on intercultural understanding and foreign language proficiency, but also in their, develop in their career development. Um, so, um, uh, we, um, we, we uh, I, I saw from the, the, the pre-survey that most of you work uh, in schools that support the opportunities uh, to initiate invest mobility activities. So my question to you, you can uh, reply in the chat, uh, is uh, if you were involved uh, um, actively in the mobility project yourself or with your students. Okay, so I see. Okay, great. I see positive uh, uh, answers. Okay, great. So I'm going to um, to tell you how we build our project and what was our idea and also the scope, the intention, and what what were the results uh, uh, actually we, we we reached. And I will discuss with you also on the tools that we use. So, um, based on a confrontation that uh, mainly our applicants, uh, uh, the governorship of uh, Istanbul had with the partner schools, um, we uh, realized that the most commonly widespread problems in realizing a mobility project for school are not, let's say, a lack or not enough skills in schools and company staff. This uh, is related mainly to um, the English language learning, um, English, English language uh, teaching, sorry. Um, knowledge and uh, the, the knowledge of the program and its rules. Uh, the cost of consulting firms that can support in realizing this project and also the lack of a shared environmental line for partner search. We focused on this third problem, the lack of this environment online. And uh, th therefore, that is why we realized this project with the, with the aim to, uh, to create this, uh, this, this, uh, this platform. So my question to you if, if, if uh, these are also the problems that you encounter, if you encounter any problem in uh, realizing a mobility problem, uh, project uh, in your school. I will wait for some replies. Or maybe there is a problem in uh, finding suitable partners, for example. Okay. I will reply only to Mark, who said there are uh, uh, EU platforms for uh, uh, VET mobility in. Um, at, at the moment, so uh, we, we will talk about that uh, later. So, um, I will go on with my presentation and say that we, we developed this uh, platform uh, based on five phases, an analysis, design, development, test and delivery, and maintenance. 
Uh, yes, sorry, sorry. I, I just because I'm seeing the chat and I want to reply to some of you. Yes, there is a twinning, but it's um, it's a bit different because here we are talking about uh, uh, a relation between the vet providers and the um, labor market. So putting together these two in order to realize uh, on the job uh, mobi transnational mobility. Uh, okay, so I go on and then I will, uh, we will see other uh, uh, inputs. So the analysis uh, was uh, carried out uh, delivering uh, five uh, uh, questionnaires to five companies and five schools in uh, each country. And uh, um, we, we chose uh, um, institutions that had already had experience in mobility projects and uh, also uh, without this experience. The questions were related to their personal experience, their willingness to be involved in mobility projects and to use the platform and which features they would have appreciated most in the platform. Um, uh, then we uh, we went on with the development phase, which was carried out by our uh, partner at Bogazici University. They designed the software interface, the user guidelines, and the platform itself. At the beginning, this is something I can discuss also with you, we had the idea to uh, involve schools and companies uh, that already had a peak number in order to, to have partners uh, uh, that were already aware of the program, of the Erasmus Plus program and of mobility um, projects uh, um, as well. Um, uh, we did a testing phase uh, involving uh, six entities in each participating country and the results were some strengths and weaknesses that were highlighted. Uh, fortunately, let's say that uh, uh, the, uh, the strengths were related to uh, the main aim of the project, which, which was to create a tool that was useful to make contra contacts with uh, um, among transnational partners. It was good for mobility projects and you can find relevant partners and offers uh, meaningful for what you're looking for. And it's easy to use. Uh, among the cons, there are uh, the full potential is not clear, so some procedures maybe were not uh, very um, detailed, and uh, uh, there was a missing area for direct communication, a forum, and it was difficult to access using the PIC, and also some uh, things related to the graphical appeal of the of the platform. Um, uh, so, um, this is the last one. I wanted to show you the platform, but I cannot exit the, uh, the presentation, so I will show you just uh, a few pictures about it. But I want to share with you in the chat. Uh, okay, but maybe, yes, they already shared the, the link of the, um, of the portal. Uh, so, um, I want to show you just some features, uh, for example, uh, what we did uh, based on the test results were some changes uh, related to the cons that we had identified and um, and uh, we, uh, we we put we improved the user guide and the fact in order to speed up the procedures and the processes and describe them step by step uh, to either to make them exploit uh, the platform in its uh, full uh, potential and uh, we translated it in uh, many different languages mainly the languages of the partnership uh, and we uh, put some features like the advanced search and the list uh, uh, and the list of trainings. After this, uh, uh, as I told you, I was I mentioned the peak uh, uh, thing. It was very difficult. For example, in Italy and in Germany, we couldn't find many companies that had the peak number. And uh, and uh, yes, it's uh, it's different. But the, the project is closed, uh, and uh, the, before we use the peak uh, number. And um, basically, many companies do not have it, and uh, uh, the problem is that when they have it, it's linked to the email or phone of high management people. Therefore, they were reluctant to use it in the platform. We created two different uh, um, accesses, one institutional using the PIC and the password, and the other one individual using uh, uh, the email and, uh, um, and the, the, the password, so that we could uh, provide also the teachers the possibility to get in and and then to talk with the schools and have an institutional um, an institutional uh, approval. Uh, then this is the interface when you get into the platform. So you have an area with the trainings to create your offer to manage your trainings, and you have also a, a session where you can uh, manage uh, the, the the agreements for rating also the, the the platform to edit your profile, and you have different uh, different features. 
Um, this, this is the interface that you see in the list of trainings. You can see the title and, um, and the description of the training, um, the date range, uh, also uh, the, um, the, the, the qualification level that is required, uh, and the language of interaction. And you see small parts of uh, uh, flags, which is the, uh, the place where the, where the training will take, uh, will take place. Uh, these are some data on the use of the platform in the, the, late, the last month, in May, so you can see there, there are no huge uh, numbers, uh, and uh, mainly are from Turkey, Belgium, and Italy, which are the countries that participated in, uh, in, the, in the project, because our German uh, partners was linked also to the Netherlands and Belgium, they had contact there with, uh, uh, with schools. So, uh, what next? We would like to improve this, this platform, to improve a, a, a place where these experiences can be shared and where um, contacts can be created for, for transnational mobility. So, my last question to you is if you uh, believe that a platform like this can be useful for uh, that transnational mobility and uh, for improving a part, a complementary pathway of work-based learning. We are, while you reply, I tell you that we are, of course, aware of the importance of an integrated pathway of work-based learning in a transnational perspective, and also of the importance of cooperation with other stakeholders in work-based learning. And, uh, of course, if the difference in VET systems uh, in Europe is uh, a value, uh, we need also to create uh, a quality guarantee that can itself create reciprocal trust that can enhance mobility and also the recognition of knowledges and competencies among the different systems. Okay, okay, thanks. That, that's nice to see that uh, you find it useful. So this is my presentation, the presentation of our uh, project. I think we, we will have uh, uh, some time to, 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 to have some uh, questions and answers. Thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot, Monica. I think it was really great, and uh, I saw a lot of positive feedback regarding the platform. Thanks a lot. It was really useful. So we have also uh, the third speaker, but right now I believe that she experienced some technical issues to connect. So I think that we can also spend this time to uh, ask and answer the questions. So I would give a couple of minutes. Uh, if you have any questions to type it in the chat, please do so now so we can address it to our speakers. Okay, Monica, I believe that this question from Mark um, is for you. Uh, he asked if a company can register, who was checking if an actual training can take place. At the moment, uh, the, all the, the, the control is in the hand of the Bogazici University. They monitor uh, all the, the, the steps and the procedures uh, um, in, the, um, in the platform. So they, they monitor if uh, the, the offers are then concluded, if there is an interaction, if there is a contact, uh, um, everything. And I want to reply to another question by Mark, which was the, the feedback from the company. Actually, as I said, uh, in, in Italy and in Germany, we, we, we had some problems in involving the, the companies. Therefore, when I said also about the, um, the integrated action, I meant also campaigning to engage host uh, companies uh, and to, to, to make them interact in the platform in order to have more uh, possibilities uh, of realizing this um, transnational mobility project. Yeah, sure. I just uh, picking up a, a, a comment from earlier, if that's helpful. Yeah, sure, sure. Hi again, everybody. Uh, this was a comment I saw earlier that um, we said we become tech slaves. And uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more about that. I think we've all become tech slaves at the moment. 
Uh, I think we have to learn ways to to work around it as well. I went for a, a 45 minute walk before this webinar just to clear my head and to get myself away from the tech. Um, I guess the advantage of tech is also is that it's also uh, full of examples of, of, of how not to use it if you look on the internet. Um, so I just thought I'd put that in as a tip. Thanks a lot, Andrew. I think during your presentation there was also another question um, which sounded like uh, how can we deal with the problem that the practical lessons are Yeah, that that is that's a really big issue. It comes up in all the the um, discussions and webinars that we've been in. It's, it's an enormous problem for VET at the moment that the technology hasn't been implemented and used. I was looking the other day at um, uh, a really good simulation for welding. It's uh, augmented reality, so but that means you, of course, you need to have some um, some kit, some some pieces of equipment uh, that you use. So you use it in a workplace uh, and it's a substitute for doing real welding because it's more cost effective. You can do get in more practice sessions. You don't have to worry about preparation and then cleaning up afterwards. But the but it's uh, obviously you can't use that at home unless you send uh, people this remote learning equipment. Um, and of course that has been possible for in some sectors um, I mean, we've seen how news companies have got around this by sending uh, high quality cameras and recording equipment and microphones to people in their homes. But uh, that's a level of funding that um, has been sadly lacking in, in vocational education training in most countries. Thanks a lot, Andrew. We also have a question. Uh, do you think that digital tools can substitute actual internship? A substitute for internship. So um, I, I guess they, I guess you, they could. Yes, I think, I think already people are thinking about how to do a, a, a larger proportion of their courses. At, at home uh, rather than having to go somewhere. Um, but it, it's interesting to think about a virtual a transnational mobility in this context, moving between countries. Uh, I was doing some work recently on um, using the ECVET principles um, and, and how to, and thinking about also quality and mobility and longer duration mobility, which is a bit of a subject that's not very current because everyone's at home but hopefully at some point um, transnational mobility will become uh, come back into come back into place and the the, the issue there is the actually the, the the lack of use of digital assessment tools uh, to to assess people um, I, it, it's interesting I mentioned the, the rate of take up and there's a whole set of obstacles and barriers that have, have seem to have been inhibitors to people taking up and using technology, uh, those timelines I showed, when, when you put those together, it's quite remarkable that the technology has been here for quite a long time, um, but um, for a whole set of reasons hasn't been taken up. Uh, as I mentioned already, I think one of those reasons has been funding, but now hopefully um, it's become clearer to everybody uh, the value of that funding uh, in the future. Another question we have also for both speakers is what can STEM education learn from that? Again, I'm not sure if Monica wants to say anything about that. But 
<laughs> that's a, it's a, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure I directly know the answer to that. I think I think it might have something to do with the practical experience um, side of things. A few years ago, I worked in the UK on a new program that had been introduced by the government, and it was giving engineering experience uh, to young people from the age of 16 in schools because in fact they the problem that universities were reporting was that uh, people at 18 who went into universities didn't have enough experience of actually doing engineering things in in workshops that too many of their students had came, come from mathematics backgrounds and actually they didn't have the hands-on practical experience so I think there are there are some lessons there from the work-based learning side of things uh, that could feed into to STEM, um, and it can go both ways as well. Uh, computational learning is mentioned in the OECD study I, uh, that I mentioned earlier, and I think there's um, there's potential there for uh, work-based learning and VET to think more about um, how uh, it can use and develop. Um, STEM in, within its own programs. Sorry if I may just add a few words. I agree with uh, with what Andrew was saying and uh, I wanted to highlight, I, I mentioned another um, project before uh, Yvette which was called Discover and in that project we tried to um, make a co-creation process uh, between universities uh, and uh, vet, the vet sector uh, for uh, materials for a science outreach and um, let's say trying to, to, to fill a little bit these gaps that you were uh, mentioning between the two um, the, the, these two uh, environments. I see a comment as well regarding the point of Erasmus plus and other transnational mobility programs to be to develop cultural aspects. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think I've talked about the economic side of VET, but I think we shouldn't forget the other aspects of learning, um, social skills, but also civic skills, um, social responsibility skills, and that type of thing. Absolutely. This is, uh, the, let's say, the most important part, you know, because basically you can do the on-the-job experience also in your in your country. Transnational mobility is something different that maybe adds something more uh, to 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 to, to the, um, the the on-the-job experience, which is related mainly to the intercultural uh, competencies. And I think one of the problems, personally, is that it's not possible to have full recognition and validation of those other skills because the focus is on, on technical skills uh, very often, not always, but very often. Um, and it is those experiences are provided for people because um, they can have a, a sort of holistic kind of experience, but they don't get any recognition for those extra skills. And I think we've got to think of new ways in which um, people can um, have received some sort of credit for those. Because this, uh, it's true that these skills are not uh, valued; uh, they are not given the, the right value at the moment. Thanks a lot uh, for both of our speakers.